Hello and welcome back to learning about stellar evolution and the life and death of stars. Now in this video we're going to be talking a lot about the HR diagram. So if you didn't see part one or you're not familiar with what an HR diagram is, go ahead and check that out first. But if you already know, then let's just dive right in. So let's mostly talk about a star like the sun. That is one solar mass star. Because mass, it turns out, is kind of the primary determinant of how a star's life is going to play out. When we look at the main sequence, starting in the upper left corner is the most massive stars, type O stars. And then moving all the way down to the lower right corner is where you're going to find the least massive stars called M dwarfs or M stars. So the sun is a G type star, so it's kind of right in the middle. Not very remarkable. So stars on the main sequence are kind of in the adult phase of their life. That is kind of the long, steady phase without a lot of changes. But they don't just appear on the main sequence. We don't just appear as adults. You have, you know, you're born and you have a childhood and stars are no different. So long before you have a star, you just have a gas and dust cloud floating out in space. It's going to be cold because there's nothing to heat it. And the dust, dust and gas is just kind of flying around. Because the dust and gas is moving around, it's kind of resisting um, gravity, right? Because gravity is trying to pull everything with mass together. Um, but because those things kind of have turbulence and have some sort of pressure from their motion, that's going to kind of resist it. So then the cloud is just happily sitting there. But that state doesn't last forever. So eventually something happens in that the gravity starts to kind of overcome the uh, motion of the particles and starts to lead to collapse. Now this could happen because uh, maybe the cloud cools down enough because basically as these particles get less hot, they move less. Or it could be because, you know, something happened to the cloud. It was disturbed in some way. There was a shock wave from some nearby supernova or there was an object that passed through and kind of you know, led to some perturbation of the cloud that maybe increased the density and kind of allowed gravity to start winning up. So something happens and now gravity is starting to win over the pressure of the dust and gas. Now at this point, the cloud is, is going to kind of collapse in different areas because it's not going to be 100% perfectly uniform. And so some areas will be slightly denser than others. And so those areas will start to collapse first. And so you'll get kind of multiple fragments within a cloud that are all starting to collapse down. And so usually stars are born kind of several at a time. You don't usually just get like one star being formed. There's kind of a whole group. Now, as these fragments kind of start to collapse, they attract more gas and dust, which makes them more massive, which makes them attract more gas and dust, etc. This is kind of a um, kind of runaway process here as they start to really accrete matter. This process of gravitational collapse happens pretty rapidly so until there's some sort of pressure that can resist this kind of infalling gravity. And this object um, that is collapsing is called a protostar. Now, because the material is spinning even just a little bit in the original cloud, as it collapses down, it starts to spin faster and faster. And it's conserving the angular momentum. And so that leads to the kind of formation of a disk around the central spherical part of the protostar. Um, and so we call these protoplanetary disks because this is eventually what the planets are going to go on and form out of. Disks pop up a lot in astronomy for this very reason. Now this stage of being a protostar is pretty fast. I mean, it's usually about a million years or less. And again, the more, like I said, a star's mass kind of dictates a lot about its life. And so more massive stars will collect all this material faster. And so they have a shorter protostar lifetime, whereas lower mass stars kind of proceed at a more lower pace. And so they take longer. And we have actually seen protostars. Um, this, for example, is a protostar called IRS, not the Internal Revenue Service, but it's called IRS 63. And we took this um, data using the ALMA telescope, which basically can look um, in what we call the millimeter wavelength of light, which is a, a relatively low wavelength of light. Um, so it allows us to see kind of bigger particles, um, such as dust that would be in this this disk. Now eventually a protostar is going to kind of run out of gas and dust to accrete um, from its parent cloud. It'll have kind of emptied out a cavity around itself and there's no more dust and gas that can kind of fall in on it. Now protostars, because they are still kind of actively accreting, they're shrouded in this dust and gas. They're actually really difficult to observe. So I said we have observed them and we can do it, but we can only do it in kind of these very long wavelengths for that allow us to kind of penetrate deep enough into these um, initial molecular clouds to see the protostars. But once the kind of accretion stops and now the protostar becomes what we call a pre-main sequence star and it's more visible to us. And so basically this is where the star kind of appears on the HR diagram. So we call this the stellar birth line on the HR diagram and it's basically um, above, kind of above the main sequence. 
Um, and this is where a star will ori originally appear or will be born onto the um, HR diagram. These stars, if they are kind of less massive than about two solar masses, we call them T Tauri stars. And if they're about more massive than that, um, they'll be called Herbig AE or Herbig BE stars. Now at this point, although the star is not actively accreting any more matter, it is still contracting. And actually, the reason that a star at this point is hot is because of that contraction. It's not creating its own heat from nuclear fusion yet. It's just getting hot from that gravitational collapse. Because as the object becomes more compact, its gravitational energy becomes more negative. And so that energy goes somewhere and it goes into heat. So as the pre-main sequence star continues to collapse, it continues to get hotter. So now remember the x-axis of the HR diagram is temperature. So the stars at this point are going to start moving along the HR diagram to the hotter temperatures, which is going to be to the left. It's also usually going to move down on the HR diagram because it's going to be getting less luminous. Now luminosity is basically a function of both the temperature of the star and its size. And so in this case, it's the fact that its size is decreasing, which is dominating over the fact that it's getting hotter. And so that's why its overall luminosity is decreasing even as its temperature increases. So it kind of moves it down and to the left on the um, HR diagram. Now these two tracks have names. They are called the Hayashi and Henye tracks, where the Hayashi is the downward track and the Henye track is the kind of leftward track. And while a star like our sun goes through both the Henye and Hayashi, um, kind of higher mass stars pretty much just go straight left, so all Henye, and these kind of lower mass stars are primarily Hayashi, kind of going down. So we can see how the star moves on the HR diagram. Now I want to clarify here, when I'm talking about a star moving on the HR diagram, I'm talking about it moving in the parameter space or in these properties that we're plotting on the HR diagram. The star itself is not physically moving. I mean, it is physically moving because it's it's always moving, but, <laughs> but when I'm talking about movement on the HR diagram, it's a movement of the properties. It's a changing of the properties of the stars, not a physical movement in space that we're, that we're concerned with. Now, eventually, as the star is getting hotter, this pre-main sequence star is getting hotter and hotter and hotter, the temperature in its core will reach 7 million Kelvin. And that's the magical set point at which hydrogen can start to fuse. And this means the star has reached the main sequence because this is the defining characteristic of a star being on the main sequence is that it is fusing hydrogen in its core. This will become more important later, but yes, fusing hydrogen in its core. And we call this point the zero age main sequence or ZAMS. Sounds pretty cool. <laughs> and the reason we call this ZAMS is because if you look at the HR diagram, the main sequence is not just a line. It has some sort of width to it. And that's not just because of the different variations in the stellar properties, it's because stars actually do move when they're on the main sequence in this parameter space. So over time, a star will become slightly cooler and slightly more luminous. So it starts to move up and to the right um, over time. But note here that we're looking at a pretty short distance on the HR diagram. And I said the main sequence is the longest phase of a star's life. So this is a really small and slow change, but it does happen. So, they first arrive on the main sequence, they're on this kind of left edge here, which is the ZAM, so the zero range main sequence. Now the star is going to sit happily on the main sequence for the majority of its lifetime. If you want details on what exactly is happening with this, I made another video about um, what's happening to power the sun, so you can check that out. But basically, you're fusing hydrogen into helium, and that releases energy. But eventually, all that hydrogen that you're turning into helium means that you will run out of hydrogen and you'll only have helium left in your core. When this happens, you're no longer producing energy in the core. And that energy, the radiation pressure from that energy was what was holding the core up against gravity. Because remember, gravity is always trying to pull the star closer and closer in. Gravity is always an attractive force. So basically, once you take away the radiation pressure, the core starts to collapse because gravity wants to collapse. So as the core contracts, the conditions are starting to get hotter and denser, remember, because that gravitational energy and the increasing density from all the matter being pulled together. So eventually you're going to reach that magical 7 million Kelvin that set point on the outside, basically surrounding the core in what we call a shell. So this is just kind of a, a spherical shell around the core and where hydrogen can start to fuse and produce energy again. And basically while this is happening in the core, the outer parts of the star are expanding and cooling down. I'm not gonna get into the details on this, but basically as, as this core is getting hotter in order to preserve the energy, because energy has to be conserved, right? Um, the star is kind of expanding and cooling. And so this is what we call a red giant because red because it's getting cool and giant because it's expanding. And they can expand to be quite large, up to you know 300 times their original radius. 
eventually the sun is going to become a red giant and its radius will consume the location of the inner planets. <laughs> now remember before I said luminosity depends on both temperature and radius. So even though the star is cooling, because it's expanding, that expansion factor is actually more dominant. And so the luminosity overall is increasing even as the temperature decreases. And so on the HR diagram, this means that it's going to be moving up and to the right. So we call this the red giant branch. And this point where um, some stars start to go from being on the main sequence to being on the red giant branch is called the turnoff point because you're turning off of the main sequence and you're kind of going off into this, um, you know, twilight of your life, riding off into the sunset, becoming a red giant. Now, remember we said the core is collapsing. Well, the core doesn't collapse forever. Eventually there becomes a new source of pressure to hold the core up against collapse. And this new source of pressure is called electron degeneracy pressure, which I'm not gonna get into the details of, but it's pretty cool state of really dense matter where the electrons just can't get any closer together. And so that becomes a pressure that supports the core against further collapse. And this allows the core to get very, very hot. And when the core reaches about 100 million Kelvin, it can actually start to fuse helium, just like it was once fusing hydrogen. If it gets hot enough, it can start to fuse helium. And once this point is reached, it happens really fast. Basically the entire core starts to fuse helium. And so we call this the helium flash. And what this means is that stars kind of sharply turn off the red giant branch once they hit this helium flash point. And they move into a new phase of life where they're burning helium in their core now. So this is kind of like the main sequence where they were burning hydrogen in the core, except now it's helium that's being burned in the core. We call this the horizontal giant branch because as you might guess, the star is moving horizontally across the HR diagram. Like I said, we love the HR diagram. Of course, this is somewhat of a misnomer because it's not perfectly horizontal, but just as a general idea, it starts to move pretty much directly left across the HR diagram. So now the star is sitting here happily burning helium in its core, hydrogen in a shell around the core, and living its kind of new second age life. Right? But at some point that helium is going to run out again, right? Because now you're fusing helium into carbon and eventually you're gonna have all carbon and oxygen and no helium. And so at this point, the entire process starts again because now, again, you've shut off the source of radiation pressure in the core, so it's going to start to contract and collapse again. And eventually the area around the core is going to get hot enough that it can start to burn helium. So now you have a shell burning hydrogen, a shell burning helium, and an inert core that is um, basically just carbon and oxygen that's being held up by degeneracy pressure. And again, the star is starting to um, kind of cool and expand at this point. So now it's moving upward and to the right again. And so we call this stage the asymptotic giant branch or the AGB. So you have the red giant branch, the RGB, and the horizontal giant branch, which I guess is HGB, but I don't think I hear that very often. And then the asymptotic giant branch, which is the AGB. No KGB, unfortunately. <laughs> now these AGB stars, like I said, they're expanding. And in fact, they're losing a lot of mass. They have very high stellar winds, which are basically just sending particles from the atmosphere out into the system around them. Eventually, all of this atmospheric loss kind of exposes the core of the star. And so now this very, very hot core is, is basically exposed and it's producing a ton of very highly intense radiation that we call ionizing radiation because it's powerful enough to ionize all of that material that is already ejected into the space around it. So you have this kind of exposed core emitting this really bright intense light and it's kind of illuminating or ionizing all of this material that, it, that the star itself has already blown off. So the, the star blows off its own material, exposes its core, starts to emit this really intense radiation that ionizes all that material. So that ionized material emits its own light. And so it is, becomes what we call an emission nebula, which is a nebula that is emitting its own light. And these are very bright and beautiful, colorful uh, emissions. And we actually call these planetary nebulae. Now note that these have absolutely nothing at all to do with planets. <laughs> Again, astronomy um, is kind of an interesting science and that, you know, there's a lot of historical stuff that we do just because that's the way we did it, you know, a few centuries ago. So when planetary nebulae were first kind of observed through, you know, small telescopes back in the day, they thought they looked a lot like planets because they, they weren't points of light like stars. They kind of had extent and they had some color to them. Um, and so, yeah, so they named them planetary nebula. Now we know that they are just the kind of dying stages of a post-main sequence star. They're not related to planets at all, but they're still called planetary nebula.
Thank you to the 18th century for that one. <laughs> now this stage of life is not only very beautiful, but it's very important. And it's actually very short as well, I should say. This is probably the shortest phase of life that we're gonna talk about. But during this phase, basically all of those elements that the star created in its core are getting fed back out into space, into the interstellar medium. And so basically the only elements that were around from the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium. Trace amounts of lithium, but basically hydrogen and helium. That's all you had. But you know, we're not made of hydrogen and helium. Right? We're made of lots of other really cool, awesome stuff. And so are our planets and you know, lots of amazing things. Basically everything that we know is not made of hydrogen and helium. And so all of these elements have to get kind of recycled and created. And so they're created in the star and then they get put back out into the environment so that future generations of stars will incorporate them during this planetary nebula phase. Now this exposed core is, once it gets exposed, it's starting to cool down. There is no, there is no radiation source anymore within it, so it's starting to cool down. And eventually as it cools, the radiation that emits becomes less intense and it's no longer able to ionize the uh, material around it. So then the planetary nebula fades. Now the material is still there, it just becomes dark because it is no longer being ionized by radiation from the core. And it's, you know, it is exp expanding and spreading outwards, but it, it doesn't disappear as soon as the nebula disappears. It's just that it's not getting ionized anymore. So then we just have the core left and this core is called a white dwarf. It's basically an extremely dense and small star that's made out of almost purely carbon and oxygen. Um, again, it's being supported by electron degeneracy pressure, so this is really, really dense material. In fact, if the Earth was a, a white dwarf or was as dense as a white dwarf, it would have as much mass as the entire sun. So this is very, very dense material. They're also very hot because they are the core, the leftover core of a star. And remember I said it had to reach 100 million Kelvin to even be able to burn the helium. So the core is really, really hot. But it's no longer producing any energy. It's just hot. The white dwarf emits radiation because of its temperature, but over time it's very slowly cooling and actually crystallizing as well. And eventually the white dwarf will have basically emitted so much radiation or will have cooled so much that it's no longer emitting any significant radiation. Um, and at that point it will be entirely crystallized cool and we we'll call that a black dwarf. However, this time scale for cooling to happen is so long that black dwarfs basically don't exist because the universe isn't old enough to have had any white dwarfs that could have cooled this much already. But in theory, that's what's going to happen to a white dwarf as it eventually cools slowly, slowly, slowly. <laughs> okay, so that's that's it. That's what's gonna happen to our sun. Um, and this is a basic trajectory for a solar mass star. So to recap, originally it's going to accrete dust and gas from its birth cloud as a protostar for about a million years. Then as a pre-main sequence star or a T Tauri star, it contracts and heats. It contracts and heats until it becomes hot enough to start burning hydrogen. This takes about tens of millions of years. Then it will begin to fuse hydrogen in its core as a main sequence star. And this phase is about 10 billion years. Eventually, once the hydrogen in the core is gone, the core will shrink while the outer part of the star will expand and cool. And the star travels up the red giant branch for about a billion years. Once the core becomes hot enough to burn helium, it will flash and start burning helium and become a horizontal branch star for about 100 million years. Then once the helium in the core runs out, again the core will contract as the outer part of the star cools and expands, and the star will move up the asymptotic giant branch for about 10 million years. As the outer layers of the star begin to be ejected, the core becomes exposed and it ionizes the ejected material around it, becoming what we call a planetary nebula, even though nothing to do with planets. <laughs> this phase is only tens of thousands of years. As the core cools and shrinks, eventually it can no longer ionize that surrounding material, so that begins to fade, and then you just have what is left over the carbon oxygen core that we call a white dwarf. And that hot, dense white dwarf will eventually cool and crystallize into a black dwarf. And this takes over 10 billion years. So it's a pretty exciting life story for a star. But I said before that this is for a star like the sun and that mass is very important in determining what exactly happens to a star. So what can happen to a star that's not like the sun? Well, one general rule of thumb to keep in mind is that the higher the mass, the faster almost everything happens. So the stars form faster, they burn through all their fuel faster, their overall lives are faster. Whereas lower mass stars like M dwarfs, everything happens much, much slower. In fact, all of the, pretty much all the M dwarf stars are still on the main sequence because their main sequence lifetime is just so long and it takes them so long to form. 
So stars that are more massive than the sun have a very similar life up through the asymptotic giant branch, which again is after helium is used up in the core and you have a helium burning shell outside of your core and a hydrogen burning shell. But for these very high mass stars, so higher than about eight solar masses, they actually can get that core hot enough that it can burn that carbon and oxygen in there. So just like we went from hydrogen to helium in the sun or a sun-like star, eventually you, the same thing is going to happen with the new material in the core. And this happens multiple times. They also go from burning helium to burning carbon, from burning carbon to burning neon, from burning neon to burning oxygen, and oxygen to silicon. So now you get these kind of many, many layers of shells. So this is often likened to an onion. Um, <laughs> No, I'm definitely not thinking of the Shrek quote right now. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but so you have all of these different kinds of burnings that can happen because it can reach the really high temperatures and pressures that are needed to kickstart these burnings. But now when you're burning silicon, silicon produces iron from its fusion. The thing about iron is that it's at the peak of the binding energy per nucleon curve, which means that fusing iron doesn't give you energy. In fact, it takes energy to fuse iron. So you can't kickstart fusion with iron, which means once you run out of silicon to burn in the core, you have an inert nickel iron core that can't produce any more energy. So without energy being produced in the core, there's nothing to stop gravity from collapsing. And this time, the electron degeneracy pressure is not enough to resist the gravitational collapse like it was in lower mass stars. So this means that the star starts to collapse inward very, very rapidly. But eventually, there becomes a new source of pressure in the core that's called neutron degeneracy pressure. So similar to electron degeneracy pressure, but now with neutrons. That's as much detail as we're going to get into on that. But basically, this now can prevent uh, further contraction. So you have all of these layers that are falling in extremely quickly. I mean like relativistic speeds falling in. And now all of a sudden, the core stops collapsing. So these outer layers bounce off that core and you get a supernova. This is called a type two supernova, um, and they are really awesome and cool explosions. Um, and again, similar to with the planetary nebula phase, these are very important for enriching the surrounding environment with all of these um, awesome elements. And actually even more elements that are created in normal stars, not only from the fusion, but also the supernova process itself can actually produce even higher elements than iron, which we're not gonna get into the details of how that happens. But yeah, supernovae are very awesome and important. And then what's left over is that neutron degenerate core, which is a neutron star. So similar to how a white dwarf is the leftover electron degenerate core, a neutron star is the leftover neutron degenerate core. Or if the star is massive enough, that actually might be a black hole leftover instead. Because with a black hole, even the neutron degeneracy pressure is not enough, basically, to, to prevent the gravitational collapse. So the massive stars um, of the universe are basically the rock stars. They live fast, they die young, and very spectacularly. <laughs> that was a, a metaphor that one of my astronomy teachers used in college. <laughs> I always liked it. Anyway, for lower mass stars in the sun, um, again, it's going to be pretty much similar, except for some of these very low mass stars, they're actually never even going to be able to reach the point of fusing helium, um, unlike the sun. Um, and so they just kind of skip that phase and go straight to creating um, their white dwarfs with helium. So this has been a very quick, dirty, brief overview of the life and death of stars, mostly about a sun-like star, but we also talked about what happens to the more massive and less massive stars. I hope that you learned a little bit of something about stars and um, they're pretty awesome objects. We kind of take them for granted, I feel like sometimes because there's just so damn many of them, but they're still very cool. Um, and thanks so much for watching. I hope you'll come back soon. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye.